Hello everyone and welcome back to Learner Radiology. My name is Brent Weinberg. Today we're going to talk more about CNS autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. Today we're going to emphasize the amyloid related diseases and uh, their manifestations in the central nervous system. We've covered a couple of other topics throughout this lecture, including demyelinating disease, causes of encephalitis, sarcoid and orbital inflammatory disease, and most recently spine inflammatory disease. Today we're going to focus on the manifestations of amyloid that you see within the CNS, and on the next lecture we'll wrap up this uh, this entire lecture with the coverage of some vascular processes such as vasculitis, moya moya, and catacil. If you haven't checked out these other lectures, you might go ahead and uh, check them out now. But today we're going to talk mainly about amyloid-related disease, specifically cerebral amyloid angiopathy, or CAA. That's the most common intracranial amyloid that you're going to see, and uh, that's what people are often referring to if they ask you about CNS amyloid. A less common manifestation that you can see is inflammatory amyloidosis, which is similar to CAA, but you often have a more of a flare component and more edema. And finally, we'll finish up with an amyloidoma, which is a rare tumor-like condition in which amyloid is kind of deposited in the brain in almost a mass. So we'll start with a case of an 80-year-old with a history of cognitive decline and prior stroke. Here you see some images through the brain from an MRI. We have a flare, a gradient or susceptibility sensitive sequence, and in this case, diffusion. What you'll note on the susceptibility, you'll see like a number of small areas of susceptibility around the periphery of the brain parenchyma. You'll also see along the surface of the sulci, you see some uh, low signal stuff. Uh, along the surface of the brain, along the gyri, and down into the sulci. Uh, that's what we would call siderosis or superficial siderosis. Here, if you go to a different level, you just see more of the same, more of these scattered peripheral hemorrhages, more of the superficial siderosis as well. Now, here's just one final image for you from a little bit lower. You see a similar thing. You see uh, these areas of susceptibility along the brain parenchyma. You see scattered areas of peripheral uh, tiny susceptibility. Uh, these are kind of uh, the common manifestations that you're going to see here. Uh, this is a case of cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is an abnormal accumulation of amyloid in the vessel walls. As a result, you get these low bar hemorrhages, and they're often peripheral at gray white junction. And uh, they sort of tend to spare the areas that uh, you see in hypertensive hemorrhage. So you see less in the basal ganglia, less in the pons. Now, most frequently, these patients are going to be over 70 years old, and as in this case, this patient was 80 years old. Now, here you just see the findings that we looked at. You see the red arrows denote these peripheral hemorrhages at the gray-white junction. Uh, you see the siderosis on the contralateral sides. So you see this uh, susceptibility kind of coating the brain. And uh, you see that there's relative sparing of the pons and basal ganglia, which are those areas that are so frequently involved in hypertensive hemorrhage. Now here you see this patient's progression over time. So in July of 2018, you see there were kind of these scattered hemorrhages, mostly peripheral. Within two years, it had increased pretty dramatically, like you've more than doubled the number of these peripheral hemorrhages, and the amount of superficial siderosis over the left hemisphere has increased pretty drastically as well. Now we're going to move on to another case. This is a 71-year-old man. He's got slurred speech and right upper extremity weakness. Now here you see a flare, a gradient, and a diffusion again. So the same sequence as we were seeing on the prior. What you'll note is the gradient looks awfully similar to that prior. You see a number of scattered areas of susceptibility along the surface of the brain, maybe here in the sylvian fissure. So kind of similar to before. Uh, diffusion is pretty normal over here, but what is kind of strikingly different about this case is there's a lot of edema on flares. So you see a lot of white matter abnormality involving the basal ganglia, the temporal lobe, and uh, the other areas kind of surrounding these areas of, of microhemorrhage. If you come up a little higher, you're going to see it's even more drastic. So here we are kind of near the vertex. You see around the central sulcus here on the right, you see a lot of edema, scattered areas of edema here in the left hemisphere as well. So you've got bilateral areas of edema. And then you're just seeing more areas of uh, siderosis and little microhemorrhages along the periphery of the brain as you go higher. Now here's your pre and post contrast, and what you'll see is that there's not really a great deal of enhancement going on here. So it's a predominantly non-enhancing process that we're dealing with. 
So as I've already pointed out to you, the key difference in this case really, uh, which is shown here on the left, and the previous case is really all of that edema. There's tons of edema here, and I kind of pointed that out to you already. Uh, but otherwise, they appear somewhat similar. Now, this is a case of inflammatory amyloidosis. And what that really is, is it's a almost an extra manifestation on top of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So you're essentially getting an inflammatory encephalitis. But oftentimes, you'll see some of those underlying features of uh, amyloid angiopathy. So you'll see peripheral hemorrhages or little micro hemorrhages or sequela of old uh, blood products there. Now, inflammatory amyloid tends to affect slightly younger patients. So you can see them more in that 40 to 70 age group. The uh, overall cerebral burden of those micro hemorrhages tends to be a little bit less. These patients will often present with headache, mental status changes, focal neurologic symptoms, as was the case here. Our final case is going to be a 56-year-old woman with headaches. Here you see again a flare, a gradient, and a uh, diffusion here. What you've got is a mass-like kind of appearance here in the left frontal lobe, some gliosis and some edema around it. It's pretty low centrally on flare. That's kind of unusual. Most masses and other pathologies tend to be T2 bright. Here you see a little bit of a darkness on gradient here on diffusion because of that T2 effect. It's pretty dark centrally there. And if you just scroll through this, you're going to see more of the same. A centrally low intensity T2 area, a little bit of uh, susceptibility associated with it, and no real abnormality on diffusion. Now, if you look at the pure T2, so this is the Spinaco T2, and what you see is uh, just, again, like kind of dark content centrally. Uh, here you just see this is uh, just from a thinner T2 through that area, so just kind of confirming what you see, a centrally T2 dark uh, region. Now, here's your pre and post contrast pre-contrast on the left and post-contrast on the right. And this is where things can really get confusing. It really looks like there's a peripherally enhancing mass here. It has a little bit of an incomplete rim of enhancement. You see a nodular area of enhancement kind of adjacent to it. But this can really get you thinking like you're looking at an underlying neoplasm here. Uh, this just is more of the same. So I mean, if you saw only these pre-contrast images, you'd really be thinking you're looking at a glioblastoma. But that T2 appearance is very unusual. But here you see just a peripherally enhancing mass, central non-enhancement, maybe some finger-like projections of enhancement outward from that. So this is a case of an amyloidoma. These amyloidomas are rare intracranial masses with a parenchymal deposition of amyloid. Uh, again, they tend to be slightly younger patients than the cerebral amyloid angiopathy. But what you'll get is these solidly enhancing masses or peripherally enhancing masses like this although they tend to have a more hypointense center than the other tumors, they may have some internal hemorrhage and some of that T2 hypointensity can be uh, from old blood products. It can be very challenging to differentiate these from brain tumors and usually they have to be resected or biopsied to make that diagnosis. So in summary, we've seen three major CNS manifestations of amyloid. We've seen the cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is those peripheral repeat hemorrhages, uh, kind of sparing the areas of hypertensive hemorrhage. They tend to be elderly patients. We've seen inflammatory amyloid, which is uh, almost like an encephalitis type picture, uh, often with micro hemorrhages, some of which may be in the area of edema and others of which may be elsewhere in the brain. And then we've seen amyloidoma, where you get a T2 hypointense mass, you get areas of enhancement, and uh, then you get uh, edema. And this can be very challenging to differentiate from a brain tumor such as a glioblastoma. Thanks for tuning into this video. Uh, please be sure to check out the other videos in the playlist. Click here to subscribe and uh, check out the rest of the videos and be on the lookout for our future videos.